Thanks very much, first of all, um, to Andre, but also especially the conference organizers to inviting me to give this talk. It is a bit like coming home. I was attending the first Geomedia conference 2015, and it felt like something came together that should have been coming together for a long time. And I still think that Geomedia is some, a very good concept, um, and I hope we can fill it a bit more in the next couple of days. I also have to admit, though, that when Andre first asked me whether I would do this keynote, I was quite happy to agree and thought, yeah, that's like home territory. I've been working on domestication for a long time, and you can't think about domestication without thinking of the home. I've started working on the homeless quite some years ago, and uh, again, you can't think about homelessness without thinking about home, so it seemed like an easy turf to surf. But it's one of those things, as you've also seen in the introduction, everyone can say something about the home. Everyone has written about the home. So it's a bit <laughs> like a territory that's so big that it's not so easy, actually, after all. What I decided to do is trying to go through bits and pieces um, out of that large chunk of work, um, partly on theory of the home, and I can only give a glimpse of what's out there. Uh, but also particularly think about the home in homelessness, because that's what I've been doing in recent years, and I've just been granted a larger research project around that topic. Um, and then I'm going to talk more concretely about homelessness in Berlin as a particular focal point. Okay. Most importantly, though, I'll focus on this idea of ontological security, uh, which is a highly debated concept, again, um, around the concept of home, and also a highly kind of problematic term, maybe, but I think we need to return to it in many ways. So I'll come to that point at the end. I'll give you a bit of background why I started doing research on the homeless, though, because it's not a, the most obvious topic for someone who comes from media and communication. It's not a very prominent topic therein. Um, and I took a way around in kind of thinking about mobile media and communication, actually. So I was doing appropriation work on mobile media and communication, and there was a lack some time ago, um, because the lack was this combination between mobile media and communication research and mobilities, two larger fields, and they didn't really talk to each other, and you thought, why not? Okay. Um, it's changed since. I think the lack is sort of disappearing, but back then it wasn't. So I started to look into this mobilities field from the mobile and media communication perspective, and I found pieces like this, mobility was not invented by the mobile phone, so there's a defense of the mobilities field against that sort of emergence of mobile media and communication. At the same time, you can say, well, but there's something rather specific about this combination of mobilities and mobile media and communication, and this is a sort of an addition to an email I got from a student a few years ago. This idea of scent while walking, so there is this cu coupling of mobilities and mobile media and that I think is quite crucial to our understanding thereof. So again, I think it's crucial to combine these two fields, but what can we, as media and communication scholars, learn from mobilities? That it's actually a communication concept, I think. If you look at Ari's idea of imaginative virtual communicative travel, then mobilities is defined in a very communicative way. And if we take that whole idea of meaning-making as crucial to the concept of mobilities, then that's very much what media and communication has been dealing with. The whole idea of the construction of meaning around the world, but especially also now around movements. And we'll get to that when we come to homelessness, because there also is a construction of meaning around that concept of movement in terms of homelessness. More particularly, I started to be interested in this idea of immobility, and also, therefore, the concept of motility, which many of you might be familiar with. So the idea of not being necessarily mobile, but being able to become mobile. Motility implying capabilities, resources, and other things you need in order to be mobile. And this is, per se, an inequality concept, because not everyone has the same capabilities or resources to do so. And with that emphasis, I finally came to homelessness. Because in many ways, if you think around mobilities and immobilities, homelessness is an, in, well, 
it's always difficult to say interesting field in that very problematic social field, but it is an interesting point of departure because there is a lot of social immobility coupled with very, diff uh, very kind of particular kinds of daily mobility coupled with immobility at the same time. So there are certain kinds of movements that many of the mo homeless cannot do. I should also add that when I talk about homelessness, I tend to talk, I actually talk about rooflessness, but I'll get to that definition in a minute. For me, the best way to capture this has actually been sort of an, in one term is actually done by Emma Jackson, who described the homelessness as fixed in mobility. And I like that terminology very much because it sort of shows exactly that ambivalence uh, of showing that mobility here is not per se a very positive move, kind of movement, um, but rather a need, a sort of something that you cannot escape from. And in some ways I'm still in the process of maybe trying to find other terms that could describe exactly that ambivalence around homelessness. I recently found this idea of traveling in dwelling or dwelling in traveling, so combining that, so it shows the combination of both movement and stasis of trying to make a home, and at the same time, exactly that ambivalence. But I think it's actually fixed in mobility is one of the best ways of, of um, capturing that kind of ambivalence. There's another term which comes from a totally different background, Roland Barthes, talking about railway cars and restaurants and railway car. How do you say that? The, the traveling restaurants and these sort of compartments. So transported immobility is exactly, it's kind of the opposite of that, movement and immobility. But again, it kind of captures this ambivalence quite well. And I kind of came up with a term not too long ago that maybe captures another aspect of that forced restlessness, which for me captures a bit of the consequences of being fixed in mobility. Because what happens to you when you are a fixed in mobility is partly that you become restless, in a sense. You can never rest. You can lay your head down, but you cannot properly rest because you're constantly looking out for dangers and other things in the streets, and you can never come to terms with yourself, in a way. So in that sense, again, it's the ambivalence of movement and immobility that I'm trying to capture here. Okay. So now we'll do a quick shift to the question of, well, what does homelessness in Berlin actually mean. So, it, so far it's a sort of conceptual idea of that ambivalence, okay, of, of movement and stasis and coming, trying to find whatever home might be. Um, and there's a sort of try attempt to define homelessness um, by the European Union. They've got quite a good research field um, around that, and this is a, a report from the EU around that question of homelessness and this attempt to define different versions thereof. And what you can see here is actually that the homelessness is a very broad field and exactly one that covers a lot of um, different aspects of housing insecurity. Okay? So only the top one, rooflessness, is actually this image that we tend to have of people sleeping in the streets and this is the least percentage of that large field, but actually what I'm going to talk about today. But just to say that if we talk about homelessness, it's much more than that. It is all sorts of housing insecurities included in the term. And if you, if you might probably also know that this is a growing field um, and in Europe, but in Germany in particular. We also have to say the growing field is, is a bit difficult in the German context in the sense that we do not count. Um, Germany is one of the countries that has refused to count homeless and has also refused to come up with a program around homelessness. Um, so there's a particular policy around that that we might need to consider as a particularity too. That's shifting. Hamburg actually has, I'm pointing to you because you're working in Hamburg, they're one of the, it's a city that's counted homelessness, so there's exceptions to the rule. But in general, we're relying on numbers, on estimates from an NGO called Bundesarbeitsgemeinschaft Wohnungslosenhilfe, BAGW, uh, who've been trying to come up with these numbers. And what you have here is a quote 
that said originally that as many as 380,000 people could be homeless. And we're not talking about rooflessness, this is homelessness in the broader sense in 2016. But what you see here is a number that they came up with a bit later. And if we had 380, now it's 858,000. That's a shift, right? <laughs> That's a radical shift. I'll just make that a bit larger. How do you explain that shift? Um, that shift is, and again, it's estimates, okay? But the shift can be explained, first of all, for two, uh, in two reasons. One of them is the growing insecurity in the housing market, okay? A shift that we've seen elsewhere as well. But there's another shift that's been the opening of the borders to the Eastern European countries, and at least for Germany, that's a huge increase, and particularly in Berlin. Many of the homeless are coming from different countries in Eastern Europe. Okay. They came for diff with different expectations and ended up on the streets. But there is one large bit that is explained by 2016, which is the number of refugees that now get counted into that estimate as well. Okay. That explains the huge increase. And obviously this is therefore a shifting number. While they came, they were first counted as homeless, they were given, many of them were given houses in the long run, but it still it has a huge increase in the homeless population. Okay? So these are the factors that explain why it's a growing field. When we look particularly at Berlin, there's, again, estimates, 50,000 people, but between six and 10,000 people count as roofless in this. It's a city of three and a half million. People. So it's not, in some sense, you could say it's not a large number. Then again, it's not quite so small either. How are they taken care of? Um, as I said, there is no program by the government uh, that systematically tries to deal with the aspect of homelessness, and this is in German, I'm afraid, but it's, there's still money given. These are 30, 000, uh, 30 million euros in six years between 2009 and 2015. Where do they go? They go to these two places in particular, Berliner Stadtmission, Straßen Sozialarbeit. One of them, the second one, is a sort of street social working environment. But the first one, and this is very particular for our dealings with that, is a church institution. So it's the church in particular that provides um, food and shelter for the homeless. And it's in this case, it's particularly the Protestant church, um, because the Catholics are more over there in the West, okay. In the East, we, we still do Protestant. Um, sorry, but there's also, you can see down there, Catholic as well, and Caritas and others. So the church is the main provider, um, and also then also the one that take most of the money from the state. This is a, a map of Berlin in terms of where do these provisions come in, okay. And the purple one is food, and the green is sleeping places. So it's sort of spread out over the city, but actually it's not. It's actually all in the center around a particular place, Bahnhof Zoo, which is the sort of the, the, what used to be the central station, and also the new central station around there. Is most of these provisions are being given out. So what is this saying? It's just giving you the first impression of what kind of Berlin, I mean, how Berlin is sort of... Um, Cover, covered in homelessness? No. <laughs> the, how, what kind of rooflessness in particular you find? Why is this a problem? And first of all, because it's a social issue, but also I mean, it's, it's a climatic problem. People sleeping in the streets tend to have huge health problems and sometimes die. Okay? So it's not just a social issue, it's very much also people kind of simply not being able to survive. Now when we think about home, you get these sort of images around the notions of homelessness. It's temporary um, abodes that people build, and I, I'm sure you're familiar with these sort of images. Okay? What, do you, the, what do you take in order to help you build a home? You take the things that are freely available in, available in the streets, or you start having a tent, which is always the danger that that's more visible, and also therefore can be torn down any moment in time. A very typical image, and again, that's probably not specific to Berlin, but also very often takes place here, is um, some kind of shelter in the public transport areas. So while when there are very hard winters, 
they tend to open up those underground stations, but we didn't have those hard winters in the last couple of years, so this is more an individual decision to be there. And you also find examples of this attempt to find order in this chaos, plus you find examples of um, temporary shelters that are given out, okay? So attempts to always come up with new ideas around this solution. But the most common way of finding shelter is actually this. This is the biggest um, night shelter which has been done by this mission, the Berliner, Berliner Stadtmission, and this is the entry point. This is the different perspective from the door. So this is where up to 170 people at night find shelter temporarily. Shelter meaning this. It's a place to sleep, primarily. It's not very comfortable, but it's warm and clean. And you get other things, too. You get the possibility to have a shower, to brush your teeth, to just to get your cl um, clothes washed. So your basic needs are taken care of. Okay? I'm trying to get to a notion of home here, just to <laughs> in the long run. But this is sort of, sort of trying to show you what kind of um, sort of m maybe provisions are there that could be considered um, as part of this in the home building process. Um, this is the other thing you get, so you don't just get basic needs, but you also get clothes. And this is an introductory video that I'm not going to show entirely, but just to give you an impression of something else that you get in there. It's actually in German, but it's not showing it in German now. Um, so this is this night shelter, and this is the lady leading the whole thing. Um, what she talks about is that they open every night um, for everyone who comes, and they don't look at the state of people. They don't mind where they come from, so they have them come in. They give them food, um, depending on how much they were themselves given, so they have this basic provision. They also offer medical care, and in the morning, they offer social services. So it's actually a bit more than just a roof, okay? What they offer here, and this is what I wanted to show you, is also a bit more than just this taking care of. It's actually not just the other needs, but maybe a form of recognition. And this is quite crucial. I mean, I went in there with students for a week, and we also work there. It's the being talked to that seems to work best, not for every one of them, but actually being of once looked into the eye is an important aspect of coming there, and not just being given food and shelter. Okay? So it's partly that that already is sort of hinting at what might be important in terms of homelessness and home. I'll quote something else. This is from research on the homeless in Paris um, and one particular person therein. Another aspect of what might be important in terms of this idea of home and homelessness. And it's talking about one particular person. When I met him, Alex had picked a seemingly random spot just opposite Gare de l'Est. When he was not at a homeless center, Alex would spend his days and nights here. The building owned by the French National Rail Company, SNCF, was equipped with cozy nooks in between massive stone pillars. He was on the eastern side, protected by a small roof five stories above. Alex's corner, only one of several niches that were inhabited at any one time, was the one closest to the exit. His place was usually overlooked by one of the numerous police officers patrolling the station. For Alex, the police presence was one reason to pick this particular spot. Unlike many of his homeless acquaintances, he saw the police as a source of security. They made sure he was physically protected, they kept the area around the train station free of violence, they kept the place in order. Not only was Alex very careful about the surroundings of his sleeping place, but also about its orderliness. When I first approached him in early 2015, I immediately noticed how neatly arranged the little alcove was. The pieces of cardboard that served as floor coverings were ripped so that they fitted perfectly into the two square meters of space between the stone walls. 
Two layers of cardboard separated Alex from the cold stone underneath him. Another formed the wall behind him. The whole construction looked like a custom-made built-in wardrobe. Alex sat on the beige board as he showed me the rest of his trois salon living room on the pavement. During the day, his belongings were meticulously put away in a backpack and a plastic bag. Whenever he left his, the niche, he took these two bags with him. He owned a second set of clothes too, trousers, a t-shirt, a pullover, underwear and socks. They were important possessions, something to change into on wet days. His dirty laundry was stored in the backpack, wrapped in a plastic bag, separate from the other things. His sleeping bag was always attached to the backpack when he left. Alex considered his sleeping bag the, his most important possession, the most minimal home imaginable. Why did I read this out to you? Because I think it's another important aspect when you start looking at this question of making a home or homelessness and home is often this question of keeping a certain space under control. And orderliness is another important aspect thereof. And these are not particular to the question of the homeless, but it's the difficulty of creating that sort that's important in the context of homelessness. So what I want to do next is take you through, as I said, glimpses of this large field of theories of home to uh, then return to this question of um, ontological security and other aspects. But I'll take you through these first to get there, because we need to find, I think, within those definitions, a bit of what might help us to define home also in the context of homelessness. Okay. And I'll start with a quote that I myself find problematic in many ways, but also quite important, by Hannah Arendt, who talks about the four walls of one's private property, which is, again, an interesting beginning, um, yeah, that offer the only reliable hiding place. And what are we hiding from? The common public world. The reason I brought this is partly also to have this idea of the contrast. So what is home potentially? In this case, she offers a notion of a very strict distinction that we all know about that's been out there, a distinction between the public and the private, which has, as so many ways, been problematized, and rightly so, I think. But what she does also say is this last sentence, a life spent entirely in public in the presence of others becomes, as we should say, shallow. And I think that's the part of the quote that's important for the question of homelessness, because it's always this question of being able to hide away, um, which is an important aspect of this question of home in many ways. And the fragmentation or the difficulty thereof might be something to consider when we consider that idea. Another important piece of work, David Morley, Morley's earlier work that I cannot do justice to, here in this, this book, and a quote from there kind of reinforces this distinction, first of all, because he refers to Eric Hobsbawm and his idea of Heim and Heimat. So again, it's the public world out there that's contrasted to the private world. But both are referred to as home. Okay? So you have a collective home, and embedded therein is the individual home. Um, and, again, we have this sort of contrast that might help us to begin to understand how home has been constructed, but also what it's up against in many ways. And what we are also dealing with now is more this idea that that's been shifting. Okay? Why are we here revisiting the home? Because um, these sort of ideas of private, public, and also other ideas around the home have been questioned for a while, have shifted because of mobilities, because of globalization, because of all so many other things that you've all kind of heard about and written about, talked about before. But so we have a first step in this sort of distinction that home is always located again, which is the wider world, public, private, heimat, and these code of issues, and none of them is easily, um, I mean, it's, it's not without dispute. We have another one which has been quite prominent in the mobilities research is this question of dwelling. We had dwelling in movement and these sort of things. So living as a way of making a home, but how do you dwell? 
And there's also this question of mooring. Where are these places that kind of get the, the, the infrastructural um, backgrounds to ideas of movement? How, where do you actually get stuck or where do you need to kind of hold in, in many ways? And important in that other idea, I think, again, nothing new, but important to reclaim, I think, is exactly that home is not so much a static nature than a process, okay? something that emerges eventually out of different kinds of coming together. And this is supported by yet another. I'm um, see whether this has now has a t turn. No, it doesn't. It did when we tried it out. I don't know what happened there. Um, I'll try to summarize briefly. This is sort of a, a clip from uh, three writers coming together at the Brook Brooklyn Academy of Music in 2017. You see their names down there. And they are asked what they associate with home. And there's um, a definition given here, and it's probably best if I go to the next slide, that where that's kind of um, summarized, where it starts out with this kind of common trope of the detachment from geography. Okay, So for both, for all of these, this idea of home not necessarily being associated with geography anymore, but being on the move, there's also this idea that you can be at home anywhere. So they talk about being at home in Brooklyn as well as in Paris, as well as in Ethiopia and other places. Um, but what is then left if this becomes so kind of fluid? What uh, they claim is, first of all, the idea of the control around uh, of the world around oneself, which I think is, again, gets us back to also this uh, quote that I've read from Alex in his little place in Paris, controlling even such a small space, at least up to a point, is maybe an important aspect of this idea of autonomy and being in charge. And the other point that they mention is this question of dignity and social acceptance. So you're at home when you feel accepted. Um, and again, this is obviously something that's probably so partly problematic in the context of homelessness. So we're getting to a point of definitions where it's not as clear-cut as in the beginning of Arendt anymore, this either-or, but much more sort of fluid, constructed, potentially kind of uh, not very easily detectable kind of space anymore, and even the question of where space is in this construction. But again, a reiteration of the social as an important aspect of this notion of home. To problematize this further, and there could have been many uh, kind of sources to do this, I briefly used this work on extreme domesticity, which is um, an attempt to look at literature around homelessness and what is being represented therein. Um, what this author finds is particularly the opposite of this romantic notion of home, and that's a very common trope also in feminist research around the home, as well as um, research on women and homelessness, is the traumatic nature, home as the place to get away from. So the street as actually the place to be in, because it is anything but that original home. Okay, so there is an emphasis on this trauma, in particular, that's related to the home. So what is left is then new versions of trying to be at home, but not necessarily being at home in this original space. And I've included this quote because I didn't expect Donna Haraway to be necessarily writing. I, I, I didn't look for <laughs> work on home in, in Donna Haraway, but her kind of list of things, I think, is also a very good one to summarize exactly that ambivalence around this idea of home and especially the gendered nature thereof and the difficulties therein, okay? And even in 1985, and you can hear a bit of that if you think about electronic co cottage or home-based businesses and telecommuting, the terminology has changed, but again, this is an interesting aspect of thinking why has the home become maybe more important again because certain things are taking place in the home that used to be there first and were moved out and were then moved back in there. Okay, I'll just um, 
I just like using quotes, as you might have noticed. Um, <laughs> one more. <laughs> By the media theorist Willem Flusser. Um, um, he, again, as someone who had to flee, who was, who was in exile, who had a very ambivalent relationship to this whole notion of home and Heimat, and who writes quite vividly about that, I think has a good way of uh, reinforcing again that ambivalence of this notion of the four walls. And it's a good contrast to Aaron's original take, this idea that those walls are not necessarily always positive. To have them around you can be quite problematic. Yeah? To be confined to four walls can be anything but a positive experience. Okay. What I want to achieve with this is just to kind of re-problematize this notion of home, okay? And as, as, as others have done, and I think that's very clear, but since we, if we especially look at these images back in the front here, this idea of the homeliness and that notion of what home is, this kind of ambivalence is particularly important in the context of homelessness, but not only, okay? So defining home becomes a problematic issue, um, even if we've been asked to do that in the these three days here. And I want to refer back once more to Morley, who said about homelessness still that it's a traumatic experience in a culture that's so based on this whole idea. Okay, So that um, even if we think about all that problematization, to be without a home in a home-centered culture is still a very problematic issue. So I'm not trying to get away from that. Problematizing it doesn't mean that homeless is just, just one other form, but it is still an extreme form thereof. Now I want to get to this question of media and ontological security, because I think there is a missing link there that might help us to understand homelessness and home in a different way. And I was actually introducing this as something that's, again, not going to have any sound now, with a brief comic relief clip. Um, E.T., because E.T. actually talks about home and sort of wants to phone home, a crucial idea of the combination of home and communication. Okay, And also, I think, quite nicely in this brief clip, what it, uh, even if you can't hear it, what it does is kind of to say the longing for elsewhere, an important aspect of home. Okay. But yeah, Steven Spielberg, the theorist who brought us the combination <laughs> of media and communication as crucial to home building. Another one is Daniel Miller in this often quoted book about the street in London and the, the materiality of particular homes. Because what he found in there was one person, Malcolm, who found his home in the laptop. Again, not a very surprising trope nowadays. Um, 2008, maybe a bit more so, but even then, not so much. But what I like about it, again, is that it's not so much only the technology that offers the home, but what he can do with the technology, which in this case is ordering himself, archiving himself, showing himself in a particular way, and keeping it all. I like the idea of finding himself, creating order, tidying up, furnishing, dusting returning for comfort. So to translate that whole notion of what does home offer, exactly that sort of ordering process that we had before, this notion of creating a particular kind of identity that's visible or invisible in certain spaces, and then presenting that. Okay, And that makes for home, not so much anything else. So what we get here is this question of media or mediation that's quite crucial, I think, in this notion of home, and which you don't find much in the notion around home and homelessness at all. Um, and that's sort of the addition that I think needs to be done. I'll briefly have one last, before I get to ontological security, one last point about this question of this naming of home and homing, um, which I think is the more appropriate term maybe, because it allows us exactly to get away from that notion of a set space or this fixed idea, but it's the process of making yourself at home or being home or longing in particular. And it's been kind of first emerging in migration literature, 
also then my encounter with this is only fairly recent, at least with this kind of, with this part of the <coughs> literature, but also then used in queer appropriations and notions of homing as a longing therein, and the question of desire, particularly this um, paper by Fortier. Um, so this continual repossession, um, this idea of the desire for as the never quite achieved, I think is also quite useful. It's the idea that it's never fully arrived at, even when you're in it. So the idea of home is not necessarily quite what you live every day, but you might still have ideas of what you want to achieve therein. So this idea of homing desire, um, as this desire to feel at home, but not necessarily, and this was the shift at the time in the debate, as far as I understand, not this idea of going back so much as actually finding a place where you are to be at home. Okay, so not always the idea that it's only the, that what you've left in migration, but actually where you are. Okay. And Fortier turns this into this appropriation in the context of queerness and tries to see it as an, a creation of desire as this homing process. Okay. Um, the notion that this is rather important and that we therefore need to potentially reassess this notion of being at home as rather something to be longing, to be longing for. Okay. And to be longing for, but reliving it in a process of constant attachment to multiple kind of homes. Okay. But I'll return now to this point of mediation and the question of ontological security, which has been kind of debated a lot in the domestication literature, but also I recently found out in the question of ontological security as part of um, security studies and other things, where there's also a lot of debate around this notion of how far it can potentially help us to understand the question of home. Okay? And it's been criticized a lot for being potentially too conservative, too dichotomous, security versus insecurity, but we'll get to that maybe in the debate. I still think it's valid to return to it in a rather kind of different way. Where does it come from? R.D. Lang, the Scottish psychiatrist, work on the divide itself, and this is kind of emphasis on psychosis and particularly schizophrenia, uh, where he defined ontological insecurity as this idea of someone who does not, and I like that sort of expression, is lacking in any unquestionable self-validating certainties. So you have quite a strong notion of identity here, which can be problematic, but we'll talk about that. And ontological insecurity is that lack. Okay. And you have no, as he puts it, no parents, wife, child, and you can see the sort of the particular time that this comes from, um, and the gendered nature again. But is there's, you can get a sense of what ontological insecurity is about. It's a lack of something, a lack of being able to rely on this notion of knowing what the world is about, knowing who you are. Okay, so when you're ontologically secure, do you have a sense? of your own presence in the world. You have this sense of being real in a temporal sense, a continuous person, and therefore you can kind of face those hazards of life that no matter who you are, you will come across. Okay, Giddens continued this sort of order, picked it up, and kind of translated it also into this idea of how do you then secure ontologic security and it's very much an, an everyday notion that you kind of find routines in your everyday. That's one way to secure it. You find habits, you find kind of stability therein, but also that was a crucial point for him. You're in control of your own body. Again, a crucial question when you come to the question of homelessness, because you're often not in control of where your body can be or how it is presented, etc. And this has been picked up a lot in housing research, um, this idea that ontological security can only begin to emerge when you're housed. That housing is an important precondition for ontological security to actually come about. Um, so it's this normative base that we all start from. Without a house, you cannot be kind of beginning to even build that, and therefore 
this idea of ontological security being an immediate consequence of um, housing instabilities is one of those um, tropes that's being talked about there. And why is that the case? Partly because of that material environment, etc., but also especially this idea of day-to-day -day routines and, and here we're back with this notion of aren't, the idea of feeling in control because you can feel free from surveillance. Um, and when we talk about media, obviously that's an important aspect of can we still can we still feel that <laughs> if we use the media nowadays, or is that a difficult? But that's a different question than when we're talking about media and homelessness. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, why am I coming to this? Because in the domestication concept, this concept of ontological security has been related very closely to the notion of using media. And there was a shift in the domestication um, theorization of ontological security in the sense that originally the media were threatening ontological security because it still had this notion of the home being exactly a four-walled kind of in an entity where the media was beginning to make it more porous, was kind of entering it and bringing ideas in that were maybe not so common therein, and it had to be defended. In 2006, Roger Silverstone, in his last piece on the domestication concept, actually wrote that they help, the media help the individual and the collectivity to define and sustain their ontological security wherever they happen to be. So there's been a shift in that theorization of the role of the media, which goes hand in hand with a shift in what media happened to be. Yeah? So in the 90s to the 2000s, Obviously, there was an emergence of different kind of media, personalized media, mobile media, etc., that also helped this shift to come along. And this idea that, in principle at least, media use can help to define or to build ontological security. And um, this is the question that I would like to refer back to, this question of homelessness. This is a quote from um, Homelessness Research and this idea of being in control of your identity. And this is sort of, I know that Facebook is a problematic entity in many ways, but in understanding that this kind of um, media can potentially offer a space where they feel more in control okay, of this privacy and this sort of perception of others. Um, and I just briefly want to hint at sort of that there are problematizations out there, I already said that, but I, that I cannot address here around this notion of ontological security that one might need to feed into this discussion. But for the sake of my narrative, I will sort of leave them aside for the time being. So there's been a quite recently also quite a hot debate around this notion of ontological security, especially this piece by Chris Rostell is quite intriguing in terms of what ontological security maybe hides, okay? This idea of relations of power, who is in, in power to define what ontological security is, also this dichotomy that is always security versus insecurity, that there might be other perspectives, and he uses Butler um, to kind of say this conception of the subject that Lang offers is maybe just much too uh, kind of rigid, maybe also even old fashioned in many ways. Um, and that there's other perspectives out there and have been out there for a while that might be much more fitting to this whole idea of how identity is built. And I want to, I think it's, it's important to take that on board and I think there's a lot in there and I think Lang actually when you look at it is quite kind of rigid in that definition. But I still think there's something in there about the longing for ontological security that is particularly relevant in homelessness and might make it quite useful to use, um, and a, but in a differentiated manner. Just briefly for this sort of last couple of things, there is research out there on the question of homelessness and media use, but not quite enough. Um, and what we had before is particularly just representation of homelessness in the media, that's been a common trope, as well as these sorts of ideas of uh, empowerment and other things through street papers. There's quite a bit of work on that. 
But what we didn't have so much, um, sorry, these are just street papers from Berlin who tried to take a new perspective, but what we didn't have so much is this understanding of media use through homeless. Um, and most research that happened in that context actually comes from health research, um, who accidentally found, more or less accidentally found, people using um, digital and mobile technologies uh, to inform themselves and partly to access uh, health information and other things. Um, so the media and communication perspective could pr probably add to this. But what they found, that what these sort of, uh, the, the existing research seems to very clearly hint at is two important things. First of all, that media use in the homeless population is common. Um, it depends on age and other factors. This young homeless population definitely, partly because they grew up with it. And there's a lot of effort that's being put into this media use. So while we take it for granted, people in that context need to make an effort in terms of resources, in terms of even simple things like charging, um, electricity and sorts of things, or going to public places where you can access these things. But this is happening, okay? So it's an important part of how this is being used. And what is being done is also not too surprising in many ways. It's everyday usage to organize your everyday life. Um, the everyday life might look different for a homeless person, but it's primarily that, and it is also primarily keeping in touch. Um, that can be with friends or family, that can be with government services and other things. So that's a very important other aspect, the idea of identity building, of um, actually communicating with people and institutions. Um, yes, so in many ways it's these two aspects, everyday life and communication. There's recent research in Australia uh, by Justin Humphrey who also kind of looked at that um, and there, there's this particular the mobile phone, and she emphasized in her research not only that this sort of, again, friends and family contacting is very important, but, and this is the particular context of Australia, that's quite different to what we have in the German context, government services rely on this kind of access. Um, so people spend, she also did a very interesting um, kind of uh, graph in terms of how much money is being spent, so it's about, 10% of that little income that they have on these sort of access to those resources, which is much more, I think in Australia, it's like 0.2% of the, the average income that goes into those kind of um, um, services. So it's quite cheap, um, usually. But so this idea of who, what do you need it for, staying in touch, making new friends, making new friends, which is also an important, interesting aspect which we returns us to this idea of Facebook being able to provide you with a space to potentially present yourself as not first and foremost homeless, but as a person. Okay, so this is the quote I had before. This idea of privacy and in being in control, which returns us to this question of ontological security and this question of being able to kind of uh, control your environment and rely on it and yourself. Okay, um, and this is, I think, where it might be quite useful. And I'm going to end with Peter Somerville, who's been doing research on home and homelessness and the question of ontological security. Um, and I'll try to twist a bit what ha he has done in order to differentiate and take a bit on board of these definition aspects that we had. What he, Somerville always emphasizes is this idea of the multidimensionality of this question of homelessness and the question of home. And re it returns us also to this idea that homelessness is not so much about this who, this identity, but it is just a state of being in between, okay? And what other researchers also found, this idea that it's sort of the lack is not so much necessarily in this idea of housing, that's a very crucial issue, but the lack of the home is much more this idea of identity and participation, okay? So this is where 
the home is actually coming in, not so much only this level of housing. What Somerville offered was this idea of meaning of home, and he has ontological security in there, as you can see, but as only one of several aspects of senses of security. And I think this is what is very useful, this idea that home, in many ways, returns us to this idea, or at least ideal, maybe, of security. Okay? And ontological is one of them, but not the only one. And this idea of housing is actually only one again. It's the physical notion that's crucial, but not the only. So if we want to go beyond that notion of home as housing, as many have done, this, I think, is an, a useful differentiation. What Somerville does then is that the idea that meaning of homelessness is exactly the lack of these aspects. Um, so the lack of privacy is powerlessness, the lack of all these other things leads to other things that are not necessarily positive. And this is where I beg to differ. And that's the slide I would like to end with, which I, where I've tried to combine these two fields. To first of all say, again, also picking up on that idea of it's not necessarily security versus insecurity, it's often a range of these different aspects that comes together. Um, it, it's, a, it's not, I mean, it might be tempting to think if I have 20% of that and 10% of that, then I'm safe. That's not what I'm trying to say. But it's trying to say also, even in outside of the context of homelessness, it's the lack as well as the provision of these different aspects that makes for home, okay? That's exactly also this longing that even if I live in a fairly safe, space with many of these aspects fulfilled, there might be others that I'm lacking in, or at least partly lacking in. What I've also done is to add a couple of other aspects that um, Somerville didn't have in there yet, and I think are crucial though, especially in the context of homelessness, but not only. And one of them is exactly that question of media and mediation. The idea that that's by now an important aspect of this idea of the creation of, or it can be, it doesn't necessarily have to be, but it can be. So it's exactly that sort of idea that we kind of have a lack of, or maybe have a provision of where we can find a space in and through the media. And the other is the question of motility, the ability to move, okay? The capacity to move, because partly it's also that, it's not just the fixity of something, but also, the idea that you can or want to maybe sometimes move, and that's part of our notion of home. This whole idea this, that we could be at home anywhere is exactly also about motility. Okay, so this is my attempt to kind of say, while there is home out there, also in terms of homelessness, but it's these different aspects that might be able to help to better understand where there is a lack and where there is something that's already out there. And with that, I would like to end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, <coughs> Maren, for uh, <coughs> guiding us through this complex uh, terrain of the home, homelessness, uh, mediation, mediatization. Um, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, please uh, be kind uh, to state your affiliation. And uh, yeah, you can put the question. Microphones will be, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. OK, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi, Bjorn Nansen, uh, University of Melbourne. Um, thank you for your talk, Marion. That was really interesting. Um, I was thinking when you were talking from recalling back from sort of mobility studies literature, the kind of mm -hmm. relationship of mobility to immobility. Mm -hmm. You know, that mobilities rely upon immobile infrastructures in order to facilitate movement. And, um, and immobile, inf so the, the question of infrastructure I was thinking about, and I was trying to kind of locate that in your work here, particularly picking up on like um, Humphrey's work in Australia on homelessness mm -hmm. and people who have used that to think about um, 
you know, some that, that sort of in between security, insecurity, and kind of mo mobility stasis and, and homeless and homelessness, um, is the kind of you know media infrastructures that can kind of facilitate a sense of belonging. So the media is not just a device like I'm at home in my laptop, but you know things like free Wi-Fi in public space is a kind of infrastructure that kind of underpins and supports a sense of kind of um, uh, being at home or being able to kind of resource the kind of the things that make home possible when you when you no longer have a home. So I was just wondering where infrastructure kind of fits into your kind of model and, and discussion. Hmm. I think it's a, it's a very crucial point because at other point in other parts of my work I think about infrastructure a lot and I think it's one of those again one of those overlooked fields in many ways. Um, and we've, we've just finished a research project that had nothing to do with homelessness but with, with media and time and there was someone in there who'd been temporarily homeless and who described exactly what you were saying, the way that he, he kept himself up by kind of structuring his day so that he would be at certain points in certain parts of the city where he could get free Wi-Fi and at least have that connection for a while that he still felt part of being in this public world. And that was very crucial to then move him out of, the, out of that homelessness phase again. Um, and I think coming from a country where we're supposed to be quite on top of the world in many things, but lack a lot of <laughs> these infrastructures. And there's very little public Wi-Fi where I come from and these sort of things. And I've just recently been to Australia and found it quite a different environment in that sense. Um, I think that's part of this whole access structure. Um, and the other thing, I mean, that would be, I think, one thing that tends to be overlooked is exactly this sort of question of electricity. Yeah, so it's not, I mean, if you have Wi-Fi but you have no battery left, <laughs> it doesn't really work. Um, and all that sense. But I think in some sense that's the next level um, because we had a lot of uh, the political debate around this provision of the basic technology and also... Um, the basic kind of access point, not just access point, but you need to have a phone to start with and you need to have some char a page scheme in order to stay connected. And there's been this question that has been sort of brushed aside by politics whether that should be provided. Um, and I think it returns us to this idea of universal access that's been not discussed for the last decades, I think. And in many ways, I think, yes, especially if you look at Humphrey's work and in Australia, it's it, crucial. Because it's it's just it's it's not just about home, but it's about being able to access the very basic services that everyone needs nowadays. But it's also, and this is what this research points to. And I've, as I said, I've I've been fighting to get money to do this research, and it's been ongoing fight, and we've just now got money to do so. <laughs> so in a way, I'm still anticipating certain results. But I think this notion of being able to even just play around with your own identity of finally being able to present yourself in a different way than you would usually be seen as in these public spaces is also a very crucial aspect. So yes, infrastructure, yes, and if that could be both improved as well as sort of included in that question of how do people negotiate these infrastructures very often, I think that's a crucial point, but also beyond that, um, I think in many ways. Any other questions, reflections? Yeah, perhaps I will use this juncture to throw in a question or two, if that's okay. Um, perhaps I'm belaboring the obvious, but um, you briefly showed us uh, a slide of an article where the post-colonial and the questions of the home emerge. Uh, this is, um, to put it, uh, um, yeah, um, perhaps harshly, it's so Eurocentric, hmm. this yep. notion of the home, conceiving the home as in this particular way. So uh, could you, could you, have you reflected on that and are you, uh, what, what, what would that imply in relation to say questions of ontological security for instance? I think in, in many ways, absolutely right and I've also hinted at that some of the literature I've only recently come across and it's difficult to, <laughs> to accommodate everything in there and it's interesting that you find it in fields that I didn't expect like the security studies field is not one that I've engaged with before and suddenly there's a huge debate around ontological security there and sometimes they're quite good at suddenly taking on board those kind of um, other inputs and the post-colonial is definitely something that needs to be considered there as well. 
at the same time, in order to, I mean, one defense is simple to say, well, there's, it's difficult to take on board everything, but that's not a very strong defense. The other thing is that I think if I do research in Berlin, this Eurocentric idea of the home is very present. So it's difficult to get away from, in a way. And I also think, and that's one thing that I haven't thought through, but I, I've been thinking in the last couple of days that maybe it's not so much ontological security and the sense of the home as a, as a factual experience, and that's difficult to also put into words what that would that mean, but as the, the ideal that's sort of lingering over everything, and that makes it so problematic in many ways, that that's exactly the sort of what you're striving for, um, partly because it's out there as an idea, and I think we partly need to get away from that, but it's not as if it's not... It's, the discourse is exactly sort of Eurocentric in that way. Um, and that also makes it it's sort of the framing of homelessness as lessness, as a very sort of, uh, as the, it's, it's always the lack of rather than sort of what is it. I mean, and there are people out there who want, I mean, it's not the, the majority and it doesn't take away from the problems, but who want to be out there on the streets and all the sort of, the agency is taken away so quickly. And that's also one of those aspects I think that gets taken away through this Eurocentric idea. And just briefly, um, there is also the other side of homelessness, what one might call privileged homelessness, mm. where you become you know, actually to be homeless away from home uh, is uh, seen as a sign of uh, yeah, status, basically, and power and uh, money, economic uh, capital, etc. Uh, I'm, th I'm thinking about the tourists who, who willingly become homeless certain period of the year or several times during the year, for instance. So and, there is this... And not just that. I think it's also yeah. the... the I, think, I mean, one part that I cut out was also about this sedentarism versus nomadism debate, which, again, the nomad has been sort of as heralded as this figure that we strive for and, and the cosmopolitanism and all these sort of things. And I think that's actually really nicely captured in, in Emma Jackson's work and when she has an introductory scene that she describes where she's away, kind of on her way to a conference at King's Cross in London, just about to enter, I think, the, the, I don't know, to what train or something to then go to the airport. And on her way, she meets this uh, youngster that she's been research, doing research with this homeless youngster, and they kind of, they talk to each other, and it's exactly that sort of fixed immobility. This person cannot go on the train and fly off and do what we do here right now. Um, in that sort of, um, I'm leaving it behind, I'm everywhere, I mean, I can f set up home anywhere, and it's that sort of ambivalence that I think is, is, is crucial here. Um, that's, yes, there is obviously that notion that also in these writers that you can hear, it's exactly, well, I, I live in Brooklyn, I live in Paris, I live everywhere, and I can feel, I mean, I don't know, it's, 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 it's wonderful, I can be at home anywhere, as long as I'm accepted, though, as long as I have dignity, as long as, and these sort of, I think these preconditions are so not fulfilled for so many people, that that is exactly the problem. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, it's Les Roberts, University of Liverpool. I mean, I think it's just partly picking up on what was said there um, about home, um, kind of the ethics of home, because mm. there's a certain hospitality kind of assumptions mm. about who or, or what you let in. Um, uh, and you know the, the, the sociality of the, the ethics of that. Who has the control? Um, control is a term that, that came out a lot in your talk. Mm. So uh, control seems to transcend the spatial. You might have control over your space, your domain as home. It's also control about your sense of self. It's ontological control. Um, but that control can be controlling in terms of your home mm. becomes something that that is is a boundary to others. So it comes back to kind of hospitality rules mm. or the kind of ethics of, of the permeability of the boundary of where you're placing your home uh, or what it is you're kind of demarcating from home from what isn't home. 
that kind of thing. So I just wonder if you could say more about that, the, the, the kind of control, uh, how that can work positively, but also in terms of it, it can exclude. There, there's kind of mm. ethics there around it. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I'm, I'm now reminded of something that I also read while preparing for this, which has nothing to do with homelessness, but it's kind of stuck with me in terms of hospitality, which was um, descriptions of, of, of people who had migrated to, to Germany and, and kids who were playing with other kids in their homes, in the German homes. And the question of, um, were they invited to join the dinner table? And they weren't they often had to wait in the other kid's room until the family was finished with their dinner. And I could suddenly, I, I felt this flashback. I mean, I've grown up in Germany as a German and sort of thinking, yeah, that's very possible that this is what people at, at my time would have done. They would have excluded these children from the dinner table because the dinner table was the private function that was sort of to be kept in order. And someone coming in was not something you could even consider. But this idea of a child, I mean, nowadays you think you let a child sit in the kid's room waiting until everyone else is finished is a very strange, a very inhospitable kind of idea. And they'd come from often from cultures where that was unthinkable because anyone who'd come in would be invited, obviously, to be that. And which returns us to this Eurocentric notion also, or even German-centric in this case. So hospitality uh, is, is a very important issue in terms of, I think, permeability and ordering um, and, and opening up. And obviously that's also, it can be defended in terms of saying, but we need to, it's a private space that we finally have time to discuss certain things, to arrange certain things. That's part of us keeping our order up. And this is a question I think in terms of um, homelessness is a crucial point. You can obviously also take, I mean, as, as this description of Alex, you can control a small space or something else, or you control your parents, or you can you can find ways of controlling that are not ne necessarily taking place in those four walls, but you can not so easily... Uh, no, let me just retreat that comment. You can be even... You can be hospitable in that context, too. I think that's one of the things that's been shown in terms of homelessness culture. I mean, Ravenhill and her work, who's kind of trying to show that there's a certain way of being encultured in certain ways of being together with other people, there is a lot of sociality around homeless cultures that are difficult to get out of, I and mean, that keeps you in there, partly because you're building up these new structures, and some of them might be very much about borders, um, that you have a group of people that you hang out with, and they will provide you for you, and you will provide for them, but then they also have to draw a border that lets, keeps others out. So you can have similar structures even in those kind of contexts, and that might also make for a feeling of security, and in that sense also maybe also of, of I'm not sure about domesticity, but of homeliness of sorts. Um, but obviously it's a context where that's much more difficult, where it sort of and it, it maybe differently plays out. So yeah, um, I think it's an important question, definitely. I, I was really interested in your talk, so mm. thank you very much. My name is Christy Malloy, and I'm here as a filmmaker. Um, mm. One of the things I was thinking of was, as you were talking, is in relationship to my teenage daughter mm -hmm. and a sense of home and how that has changed um, because of technology. And this idea that it's a place you go to, to, you know, to be yourself, to, so that you're not on you're not on show, you're not on display, you're not mm. out in public, okay. you're in a private place. But actually, in the home, now, I would say that that continues, it continues for young people, they're always on because of technology mm. and how it invades. I thought, well, maybe it is a kind of a form of a home invasion. And for a while, the only way you could get away from it was to go on holidays, because mm. you know we couldn't afford to have data roaming switched on. But now, <laughs> data roaming is everywhere. So I come to Sweden, and I can, I can just use my minutes as normal. And so that also changes. You can't get far enough away to, um, to be off rather mm. than to be on. Um, and at the moment, I'm reading, um, rereading to the Lice House, and Virginia Woolf describes uh, this wedge-shaped core of darkness that you can dip into and sink inside to not even be yourself, a place where you don't even have to be yourself, because what does that mean? And I'm just wondering whether our notion of 
home has been affected and changed by um, you know the ever presence of media and the access that we have and the the need to be always on and available even into the night. I mean sometimes I'm woken up at four in the morning and my daughter's going to the toilet um, and she's probably been on her phone all night long. I've no idea. Um, anyway, I thought there were a lot of really interesting <laughs> thoughts. No, that's, I think that's exactly why it's interesting to partly return to that domestication literature and this early ideas of how uh, this idea of media creeping into the home has actually had an effect on that nuclear family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's lots of problematic ideals around that. And then to sort of see, well, it's, it's becoming 2006, and you're sort of at that point of saying, no, no, we can use it to build. And now you can ask yourself, but how far have we come since? And in, in, in this research project that I just mentioned, where we talked about a time and media, it was exactly the switching off which was always talked about, the sort of where do I need to go in order to be able to switch off. Um, I, I, when I go to away on that weekend, that's when I'm offline. Or um, there's suddenly this whole idea of, and which is a very luxurious idea, but this sort of three people in this research of 24 said, oh no, I'm going to go to the monastery and, and sort of switch off for three weeks. And you think, God, I mean, sort of, wait, God, yeah, probably <laughs> monastery. But this whole idea of, of, of that, this ideal of switching off has obviously suffused now, and it's not so much for teenagers as for everyone else beyond 20, maybe, or something, that it's, that's the new thing to be able to return to yourself in a way. And that's exactly the question, though, which is, highly problematic, I think, in ontological security, but as a question, really important. What does it mean in terms of identity, in terms of this sort of seclusion? I mean, do we need to, maybe we, we're beyond ordering and closing ourselves off. I'm not convinced, but um, maybe there, we're open and everything can come in, but we can go out. I mean, but I have this, uh, the, the, the hunch that there is something in there that's still necessary in order to not, to end in chaos. So in that sense, the switching off is become an, a kind of cultural ideal, but maybe also just a necessary, maybe it's not switching off, but maybe it's at least an awareness of when this kind of closing the doors in a more virtual sense can and take place. I mean, how do you do that? You maybe, maybe you can do it online as well, but what do you need to do in order to yeah, be offline? Hi, Doug Tewksbury, Niagara University. Mm. I think it's also interesting as we think about monetization mm. and how platform surveillance and platform capitalism is built on monetizing the everyday life. And so you think about like the internet of things and geofencing and targeting ads inside the home as this invasion. Mm -hmm. But your, your talk also had me realize that, you know, this works for the homeless too, right? Facebook doesn't care. Like they're selling the same impressions no matter what. And so now you can monetize the 800,000 precariously homed people in Germany or, or wherever in a way that I, I think was inaccessible to the platforms before. Definitely, and that's one of the aspects that makes that quote on Facebook a bit <laughs> not quite easy, you know, the idea of being able to retreat in Facebook and not being surveyed is um, <laughs> seems like a contradiction in terms, and I think it is in many ways, but that's, I still think in terms of that basic idea of, of homelessness, it, it maybe that's not at the forefront, while for it should be for many other discussions. Um, but there's, it's, it, you, you're right, I mean, there's, there's one thing that I didn't um, show that you might have come across. This was a South by Southwest um, kind of experiment on the homeless being given out MiFi um, technology that they carried around with them, and then they had these wonderful T-shirts like the students do here, I think, <laughs> but not quite in this sort of. So they offered their services as a hotspot, and people who were attending the South by Southwest festival um, could then access them and say, "Look, um, I need to connect," and therefore these people could so th then get a donation. So it was partly sort of. And similar to they it, the basic idea that they claimed was happening was to update the street paper idea to nowadays. Okay, and obviously that's been debated a lot in the objectification of these people and how can you do that? But then again, when you read about the experience of those people, um, and this is in a way an answer to your question, 
the experience was not so much that they're sort of technologized or even sort of in some sense also be, you could trace their movements obviously and all those sort of things, but they said, yeah, but people talk to us. You know, they stood there and talked to us and suddenly asked us who we were or what we were doing there. And actually it was a great experience. I mean, that's too simple, I know, but there's something in there about this question of technology, maybe not always sort of seeing what else it does. Maybe it doesn't matter in that case whether Facebook traces them, um, although there is an ethical issue, but maybe it is more about the communication in that case. Um, but yes, we, yes. It, the, the, the question remains. And it's been posed in other contexts too, like in Denmark they had them carry around these GPS devices in order to trace where the services are offered. And that's been an ethical debate. And, and then the aim is good to offer better services, but can you do that? Um, Um, uh, Christine Quayle, I'm at McMaster University in Canada. Um, so I loved your talk, thanks so much. Um, I w as you were talking, I was thinking about um, some resonances with Virginia Eubanks's work on the digital poorhouse, and I was thinking um, her book, uh, Automating Inequality, uh, and she comes up with the idea of the digital poorhouse, and she's sort of tracing historical roots of, um, you know, these, you know, again, like sort of segmenting people living in poverty and uh, but then how now digital technologies um, are being used to sort of automate some of the social mm -hmm. services that are then using these algorithms that make decisions about who gets which social services. And so I was, I, I don't know, I was thinking about how that, how that's related to some of the um, ways that you were thinking about how can we probably problematize the idea of the home and where's the power and who gets to decide what is home. And I was thinking about how data driven mm. notions of home um, might play into your work a little and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I don't think it's, 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 it's cru I mean this whole idea of whether the, the, the replication of inequality is not even worse in these kind of cases of datafication I think is a very crucial one. Then again, I have to say, <laughs> sometimes the, the, the slow notion of, uh, the slow nature of German <laughs> bureaucracy is quite intriguing because we tend to hang behind in that regard. Um, that sort of, we don't do that yet. <laughs> so, I mean, at least not, I mean, the, the, the services are not provided in that way. And so, in some sense, this sometimes quite right, annoying uh, lagging behind can serve at least for the time being and that time might not last very long, in that uh, sort of for the homeless. So they're not uh, kind of registered in that way. They're, so they're, they're, their needs are not registered in that way either. But you're obviously that doesn't kind of, it's not a good answer to your question because I think it will become an issue at some point. Um, and in some sense, I'm not sure how the notion of home plays in there. I mean, it's, it's the datafication and inequality thing. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to read the book. That sounds really crucial. But yes, and obviously, if you think about what they provide, then that would be an interesting analysis. I mean, what would be offered and what would be taken away? And that's exactly in that debate around the mo mobile phones that's been quite crucial. I mean, it's this hierarchy of needs that's not spelled out, but kind of implicitly there. So obviously it needs to be housing, and then and this sort of, and it needs to be food, and then why could you think about such a luxury as communication? And I think in that sense there is a definition of, maybe not explicitly home, but around that notion of what does a, what does a human being need in order to live? And that's sort of a debate that's not openly actually taking place, but implicitly. And yeah, that I think surely some examples of datafication, and I'm sure Australia is actually a good point where the services are provided in a different way, where one could look, and probably some other countries too, where that's already in, in place, actually. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, you talked a lot about the lack of certain resources mm -hmm. uh, to, for people to be able to establish the sense of home. But I'm thinking about if the notion of home itself is debatable, then I'm a little bit worried that if we are too concerned about uh, uh, the lack of certain mm -hmm. resources, then home 
can be a fixed idea, uh, a, a kind of a fixed aim for longing, for desire. It seems that home, the, the home is always something to desire for. But sometimes the home can be used uh, to, to deprive or to deny certain people's notion of home. Uh, for example, China is very good at in making homeless invisible or try to uh, eliminate the, the phenomenon of homelessness in the street, in the city street. So for some people, being homeless is probably better than being sent to the detention center. So I'm wondering whether you can reflect on this danger of seeing certain notion of home as particularly something to desire for or for longing for. Mm. Yes. I think that's, that's actually been part of the aim of the talk is to, to problematize that, is sort of saying, I'm not sure that we can let go of a sense of, and I've called it security for the lack of a better word, um, and I think that this fixed notion of home is exactly what is problematic in this debate. But the process of finding senses of security might be something that's more appropriate to get to that. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't let go of that, though, because this is the returns us to this point of what is what, what kind of stability do we still need? And I think a certain sense of stability and security is a, maybe a problematic, but, but in there. So the senses of security, I think I would hold on to, but not a fixed notion of home. And yes, this was partly also the reference to these traumatic uh, experiences of home, etc. That's exactly when maybe notions of home are not necessarily what you aim for, quite the opposite. And a lot of homelessness in Berlin, and I'm sure elsewhere, also is about having also having had to get away from that original kind of home because it was so problematic. So in that sense, it's definitely a more problematic na a notion within the context of homelessness itself, but also in terms of how others phrase it, surely. But the sense of security, I would still, I mean, that's my take on this so far, is that that's still needed in some ways. And without that, you are without. <laughs> Okay, any more questions, reflections? Uh, I'm sure we'll be returning to all these questions that were raised today uh, in the lecture of Maren Hartmann during the conference. Before we sign off, I would like to, on behalf of Geomedia, myself, my colleagues, extend a token of our appreciation an extra bag. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that perhaps would Sorry. make you feel at home. Sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, thank you, Maren. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> thank you. And thanks for the great questions. Definitely. The, the, I would like